Okay, I think, uh, yeah, we should get going. So um, I don't think I need to introduce Dan again, but just to say um, thanks a lot for the lecture yesterday, and today we will continue the second lecture on searches for dark matter. Please go okay, ahead. Thank, thanks, Jamie. Um, okay, so yeah, so um, yesterday um, we were looking at the motivation behind um, uh, searches for dark matter. So we we're looking at the cosmo cosmological arguments uh, and, and astrophysical arguments for why dark matter must exist briefly. Um, and then we saw how we can go about searching for it. Uh, we saw a few models. Um, in particular, we saw the Susie Wimp models. Um, we saw, um, I defined weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. Uh, and then we finished off looking at indirect searches for, um, for WIMP dark matter, which um, basically involves looking for uh, um, annihilation or decay of, um, of WIMP dark matter particles uh, in astrophysical bodies of some description. So today we're going to look at direct, direct uh, searches for, um, for WIMP dark matter. And so you will recall that of the three routes to um, detection of particle dark matter via non-gravitational interactions, which is our goal here. We, I think we, we're taking as given that um, dark matter exists now and that, and that it interacts gravitationally. Uh, we're interested in, in, in identifying it through its non-gravitational interactions. Of the three techniques, uh, we've already looked at indirect searches. So now we're going to look at direct searches. So here we are looking for evidence um, via interactions with targets in terrestrial detectors. Um, and these targets could be individual nucleons in atomic nuclei. They could be nuclei themselves as a whole. They could be electrons, they could be photons, etc. cetera. Um, and the advantage of this is that if you see a signal here and you can conclusively uh, identify that it's not due to um, a background process, as I'll come on to in a second, um, then that's a pretty clear indication that you're looking at dark matter. Um, it may not identify the particle, but it might give you strong hints. Um, so that's our um, goal for today. And um, we uh, are looking primarily at WIMP dark matter here. So this is with masses above roughly an MeV, although the depending on the model, the masses could be, go down as low as an, an electron volt, but I'm going to be assuming here that it's roughly at least uh, an MeV. Um, so we'll look at how we go about uh, conducting these searches in, in generality first, before I come on to uh, the individual experiments, of which there's a lot actually. So um, we'll be spending quite a lot of time looking at the various different technologies that are, that are used. So how do we go about uh, uh, looking for uh, direct interactions of, of dark matter particles in, in a target? Well, the basic idea, and, and there are a number of authors who were, who were um, looking at this around the same time. I mean, the, one of the classic papers is from Goodman and Witten in 1985, uh, is that um, uh, WIMPs should couple weakly to baryonic matter. Uh, so that means, uh, protons, neutrons, uh, atomic nuclei. And so if we can look for a source of anomalous, low energy recoiling nuclei uh, inside a target, then that might give us some evidence for the existence of dark matter. And this is a profitable route to, to, to take because there's relatively few processes from standard model physics that can give rise to recoiling nuclei inside um, a, a target. And we'll, we'll come on to those in a second. So what are the backgrounds to this, this signature of recoiling nuclei? Well, the majority of backgrounds, the, the most events that we might uh, confuse with this process are due to recoiling electrons. And that's a much more common process in, in the world around us. Uh, electron recoils can call, be caused by um, uh, decay, for instance. So you could have, for instance, beta decay of a, of a, of a nucleus. Um, they could be called, caused by Compton scattering. So where you have some gamma rays coming in from uh, decays, nuclear decays, either in the target or outside the target, 
and then the, those gamma rays Compton scatter off electrons. Um, and there are other processes as well. So for instance, two neutrino, uh, two neutrino uh, double beta decay would be another example. So there's lots of processes that can give rise to electron recoils, generally coming from radioactive contamination of the surroundings. Now, the nuclear recoils, um, there are some backgrounds that can, are actually irreducible, that are, are generated by uh, nuclear recoils themselves. Um, primarily, uh, this would come from neutron scattering. Um, so if we have neutrons all around us, uh, as I guess you know, neutrons have a relatively short lifetime, so they have to be regenerated around us to, 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 to be present. Um, we can get neutrons from fission of, uh, for instance, the uranium or thorium chain uh, radionuclides. Uh, we can get cosmic ray spallation. Um, so cosmic rays hitting nuclei uh, in the surroundings and um, spitting out neutrons. Um, so to avoid this, you typically need to use an underground laboratory shielded from cosmic rays and it needs to be deep for the shielding and also it needs to be clean uh, so that there isn't much radioactive contamination around. Now, what sort of energy, uh, energy for these recalls are we, are we looking at? Well, very simple back of the envelope calculation. If we assume that we're looking at uh, electroweak scale particles, so they have a mass of order 100 GeV, and if we assume that our target nuclei have a similar mass, and the reason we assume that is, as, as we'll see, that this is Conveniently, many nuclei do have a mass around the electroweak scale, and um, that's where actually the kinematics uh, are most favorable for, for detection. So let's assume that the nucleus also has a mass around 100 GeV. Therefore, if you get an elastic scattering from uh, a WIMP dark matter particle, which I'll generically label with a Greek letter chi, um, that comes in, it's effectively a billiard ball or pool ball scattering off uh, an atomic nucleus, it transfers all its kinetic energy to the nucleus. And you can then just work out the energy of the, of, of the, of the scattered uh, mm. nucleus from the kinetic energy of the, of, the, um, of the dark matter particle. Now, we've already seen yesterday that the typical velocities that we're working with here are measured in hundreds of kilometers per second. So maybe 220 kilometers per second is the velocity dispersion in the galactic halo. So these are highly non-relativistic um, uh, particles. So you can just use half mv squared. And so you find out that the typical recoil energy is around 25 keV. So we're looking at energies in the low tens of keV typically. Okay, so what, what actually does the recoil energy spectrum look like? So here's, here's a sort of, a, in all its gory detail, a, a, um, a big expression for uh, the differential energy spectrum of the rate of, of nuclear recoils. Um, and what you'll see here is that there's, um, there's a term, uh, the, the big term in the second bracket, um, which has some expressions which um, relate to uh, nuclear physics and, uh, and also particle physics. And I'm, I'll be coming on to those in, in a second. And at the end, you have a, um, an integral, um, which is basically coming from the kinematics of the scattering. So the nuclear recoil energy spectrum, you obtain it by integrating um, the uh, recoil energy uh, distribution from scattering from a WIMP of fixed velocity, and then you integrate it over the WIMP velocity distribution. That's, that's the basic idea. There's a minimum velocity, V min, that can give you the, the recoil energy you're interested in, ER. So you have to integrate from that minimum velocity up to the maximum velocity of the WIMPs. And uh, in, to be formally correct, we should set that equal to the escape velocity of the um, uh, of the galaxy, which we saw was five, roughly 544 kilometers per second yesterday. Um, so that, that integral is, is related basically to the um, properties of the galactic dark matter halo. And we normally assume, um, as I mentioned yesterday, an isothermal Maxwellian halo velocity distribution. So that we substitute that. And um, there, there's some other factors in there. In particular, the, there's a the, uh, velocity of the Earth relative to the halo, VE, um, 
then um, that, that adds additional signatures, as we touched upon yesterday, uh, which we can use in some of our experiments, and we'll, we'll come on to that later. Um, but if we assume that the target is at rest with respect to the halo, then this, this integral simplifies and it just becomes an exponential function, as you see at the bottom of this, this page. So what, what, what is this uh, big expression? What, how, how can we interpret this? Well, it's, it's, it's a really nice piece of physics, actually, because it, it incorporates ingredients from three completely separate and different areas of, uh, of physics that you might learn as, as an undergraduate. So it, it's really um, uh, in terms of uh, synthesizing um, uh, knowledge as an undergraduate student, um, this, is a, this is a really nice expression to, um, to, to bring everything together. So we have ingredients, first of all, from, of, of course, from particle physics. So you'll see in this expression, you'll see mchi, which is the mass of the, the dark matter particle. Uh, mass of the WIMP. Um, it also determines the, the coupling of the, um, of the WIMP to the nucleus. So this can take various forms. It could be a scalar coupling, pseudoscalar coupling, etc. This really depends on what, what particle is mediating the, um, uh, the scattering between the, um, uh, the WIMP and the nucleus. Um, and we can often, or we, we, we normally sort of relate that in turn to two classes of, of cross-section. So really there's two, two, although there's two, formally two um, ways of, of uh, there's multiple ways of coupling, scalar, pseudoscalar, et cetera, um, that really reduces to two forms of interaction. And those two forms are spin independent and spin dependent. So, so we have two cross sections, sigma zero SI and sigma zero SD. Uh, and those here are defined as the WIMP nucleon cross sections. Um, and I'll come back to those uh, in, in a second. Now, we then have astrophysics ingredients. Of course, we need to know the local density of, of dark matter particles because that will determine the rate, of course. So that's rho chi in the first bracket. Uh, we need to know the uh, velocity of the WIMPs in the, in the halo. And as we saw yesterday, that's determined by the velocity dispersion in the Maxwellian halo, which is V0. And then depending on how complicated you want to make the, the expression, in principle, you can then also use a, a finite escape velocity um, and also a, a non-zero um, velocity of the Earth relative to the halo, VE. Um, I, here, we're, we're just taking a simplified version, but you, there are equivalent expressions with more complicated expressions with these, uh, these set. Um, so if you look on the right, you see um, uh, a, a recent um, result on the um, uh, dark matter density indicating that 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter is, is not an unreasonable assumption. Um, the velocity distribution again, uh, the recent studies looking at Maxwellian halos with 220 uh, kilometers per second for V0 are, are again, again reasonable. And then let's come on to the, the third ingredient, which is um, the nuclear physics ingredients. So the first thing to note is that um, uh, for the spin independent coupling, um, the velocities and therefore of, the, of the WIMPs and therefore the momentum transfer uh, are between the WIMPs and the um, nucleus are sufficiently low that if you look at effectively the Compton radius uh, or the Compton wavelength rather of the, uh, of, of the interaction that the, um, if the WIMP interacts with all the nuclei the, uh, all the nucleons in the nucleus, rather, then um, it, it will interact with them coherently. So quantum, in the quantum mechanical sense, it will see not individual nucleons, it will see a nucleus. In much the same way that if you, if in higher energies, you might have um, deep inelastic scattering. As you go to higher and higher momentum transfers, you stop scattering from, for instance, protons um, at HERA or wherever, 
you start to uh, probe um, the quarks inside the, the, the protons. This is very similar, but it's just it's happening at much lower energies. So we're, we're at these low energies, we are, to a reasonable approximation, we are seeing uh, the full nucleus. Now, what that means is that for the spin independent interactions, um, there is an enhancement to the, uh, the, the WIMP nucleus cross section that goes like uh, the mass or the, the number of nucleons squared, so A squared. So this, this is called the, um, um, the coherence enhancement. Um, I've written it as ISI here. And um, this coherent scattering of um, off for, uh, nucle nuclei um, has actually been observed for the first time with neutrinos with the, by the coherent, uh, um, sorry, not, uh, coherent collaboration, which um, you can see the, the result on the, on the right here. So um, we've, we've now observed coherent uh, neutrino nuclear scattering. Um, uh, and all we're doing here is looking for um, coherent WIMP nucleus scattering. So we have, um, a, that's the spin independent interaction and it has this, this in, big enhancement, which of course, if you have a very heavy nucleus, it goes like the mass of the nucleus squared. So it's a, it's a big advantage to have very heavy nuclei for the spin independent coupling. Um, the spin dependent coupling is much more complicated. Um, I haven't, there is an expression for that. I haven't written it in the slides here, but um, it includes separate terms for the coupling to both the proton and the neutron. Um, and typically what, what is happening here is that because of the, the nuclear physics of, of, the, of the nucleus, um, there is typically one nucleon, which is carrying the majority of the spin of the, uh, of the nucleus. Therefore, um, for spin dependent interactions, you're really interacting with one of the nucleons, not with, not with the full um, nucleus. So you don't benefit from that factor of, of A squared, uh, typically. Um, so you're really scattering off one nucleon uh, for the spin dependent interaction. And in terms of what nucleon that is, well, um, from, basic nuclear physics, um, different isotopes have um, one unpaired nucleon, which is uh, carrying the majority of nuclear spin. That might be a proton, it might be a neutron. And um, whether um, uh, the WIMP is interacting with one or the other actually is, is a model dependent question. So um, some, some WIMPs, particularly if you're looking in SUSY models at Higgs Zenos, for instance, uh, there's a, it's a very model dependent question as to whether your, uh, the, the cross section, spin dependent with nucleon cross section is greater for protons or neutrons. Um, so what we typically assume is that we, we decouple them effectively. So we can present limits separately or assuming that all the interaction is either with the proton or the neutron. Um, some nuclei, as I said, have an really unpaired proton, some have an unpaired neutron, and so they will generate better, better limits or better sensitivity. So that's a, the spin-dependent interactions are more complicated, um, but the usual benchmark that most people focus on is uh, the performance for spin-independent. So that's what I'm going to focus on mostly uh, in the rest of this lecture. There are also some form factors, which you see here, F squared, separately for um, the spin-independent and spin-dependent interactions, those are basically the Fourier transform of the, of the scattering centers in the nucleus. Um, so you have to assume some distribution in space of, of the scattering nucleons. Um, for spin independent, you just usually assume that um, basically the, the nucleus is basically a ball. Um, so it's just a solid uniform distribution of, of uh, nucleons. Whereas for spin dependent, um, you usually, one, one way to work with that is to assume in simple way that the, um, the, the single unpaired nucleon is, is basically sitting smeared like a skin on, on an orange or something across the surface of the nucleus. And then you have to take the Fourier transform of that uh, spatial distribution. Of course, now there's more sophisticated ways of, of calculating these, doing proper quantum mechanical calculations in nuclear physics, but these are some sort of basic uh, rules of thumb. 
Okay, uh, I know that's an example of a form factor. And one way to think of the form factor is it's, it's almost like the, it's, it's the way in which the, the coherence enhancement is lost as you go to higher momentum transfer. So as you go to higher Q squared, um, you start probing the nucleus, just like in deep inelastic scattering with nucleons. And um, so you start losing uh, the, this big enhancement at zero momentum transfer. And that's quantified by the, the form factor. So overall, you get this expression, which uh, gives you a rapidly falling um, um, uh, distribution of events of nuclear recoil uh, energies. Um, and it depends very much on the nucleus that you're working with. As I said, heavy nuclei with large A, large atomic mass, um, give you a big enhancement if you can get to very low energy thresholds. So uh, if you can get to low energy thresholds, then you get the benefit of that A squared enhancement. So often we are looking at um, uh, for, for heavy target nuclei. So um, as I said, the, the uh, results are quoted uh, as limits on the WIMP nucleon scattering cross section. So you obtain it from that, 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 from that expression that we've just seen uh, versus the assumed mass of the WIMP. And you normally assume that there's only one interaction, be it spin independent or spin de dependent. So that's dominating the, the, um, the overall interaction cross section. And you normalize it if you're looking at spin dependent interactions to just one type of nucleon. So in other words, you assume that all the interaction is taking place either with proton, the, the proton or a neutron. And depending on what nucleus you have, that will give you uh, an enhancement in your sensitivity. Uh, if you have a free unpaired proton, then that will give you a very good sensitivity to the wind proton cross section, of course. So that very steeply falling energy spectrum um, means that if you want to have a good sensitivity, you need to have a very low detector energy threshold, well below 10 keV. Um, and so that's, that's really a key consideration in looking at the sensitivity of these experiments. And the, the, what's called the limit curve, so this is the, the um, sensitivity or limit on the WIMP nucleon cross-section as a function of mass. Mm. Basically, you can get that just by inverting that formula on the previous page, so one over it, basically. And that's what you see, you see here. And it has a, a number of features. Um, you can sort of combine a lot of the constants in that expression into just two. I've written them as alpha and beta here. And here I'm assuming that basically that all the sensitivity is coming from basically from events at the energy threshold, which is not a completely unreasonable assumption. It's not completely correct in real experiments because the, um, uh, of the form factor, um, you are also seeing some um, sensitivity from higher energy bins as well. So this expression isn't exactly right, but um, it, it gives you an idea. Um, so you have to see two constants here, um, alpha and beta. And alpha is just a normalization. So that's basically, that's determined by the limit on the number of events, um, uh, of signal events at, at your threshold. So as you increase your yield, so for instance, you increase your exposure of your detector, the running time or the target mass, then that will push uh, alpha to smaller values and the limit will go down. So that goes vertically downwards. On the other hand, beta, is determined by the value of the, of the energy threshold. So how low can you push that energy threshold? And that basically pushes this curve sort of to the bottom left of this, um, of, of this plot. So as you lower the energy threshold, um, basically the, uh, the minimum of that, of that curve pushes to the, to the down and to the left, basically. So if you want sensitivity to low mass WIMPs, then you better make sure you have a low energy threshold to push that minimum down. Now the position of the minimum, roughly speaking, is determined by the kinematics of the scattering. So it's, it's roughly around um, uh, where the mass of the target is equal to the mass of the, the WIMP, but that's assuming you have a threshold that can benefit from, from that. So you need to have a low energy threshold. And the other thing I'll point out is that high mass, this expression here asymptotically becomes independent, the, the spectrum component, so that's the exponential, 
becomes asymptotically independent of, of, of the wimp mass. So in that expression, you see mu, which is the reduced mass of the uh, um, nucleus and wimp system. And so as you go to very heavy, wimp, uh, very heavy wimps, that just becomes equal to the, the, the uh, target mass. So it becomes independent of m chi. So all of the limit curves that you see, they all are basically linearly dependent on m, uh, m chi at high mass. So they all, they're all parallel to each other. And it's basically just because the sensitivity is then dependent on one over the wimp number density, which is, which is basically proportional to m chi. So um, we, we know what the, the WIMP density is, 0.3 GeV per cubic centimetre. Um, so therefore, um, if, it's, if you need the WIMP number density, then that's directly related to MKI. Uh, the spin-dependent limits differ from, for proton and neutron. Um, and also, the, typically, when you see these, they're, they're typically something like a ten, a factor of 10 to the 4 less than those of the spin-independent searches because of this loss of uh, nuclear coherence in the spin-dependent case. So um, in many models, the greatest sensitivity comes from spin-independent uh, interactions, unless there's something that going on, which means that the spin-dependent interaction is, is, is um, strongly enhanced. Okay, um, and then to, just as a teaser for later on, um, We've here we've been ignoring the motion of the detector through the WIMP halo, but in principle we can use that information, and there's two ways that we can do that. First of all, um, if you look at the, the figure in the top right, um, as the Earth or the Sun rather moves through uh, around the galaxy in, in, in the galactic disk, um, it's means there's effectively a wind of wimps that is um, passing past the solar system and this means that um, there is a an enhancement in the uh, rate of scattering due to the increased relative velocity um, depending on the time of year so as as the earth moves around the sun um, then it can depending on the time of year it can either be moving effectively into that wind or with the wind. So the relative velocity is different and this changes uh, the flux of dark matter particles and therefore changes the rate. So this gives rise to an annual modulation in the, um, uh, in the signature. It depends on the energy of the scattering, uh, but that is one signature which can be used and has been used and I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, the other thing we can use is, is um, the fact that as a function of time during the day, um, as the Earth rotates on its axis, a detector will, which is fixed on the Earth's surface, will um, see that wind of wimps coming from a different direction, just like a telescope as, uh, on, on the surface of the Earth. As the Earth rotates, the, the telescope will uh, see a fixed point in the sky moving across the sky. So it's exactly the same here. And this means that there's a modulation throughout the day in the mean direction of the WIMPs and therefore I mean the mean direction of the nuclear recoils. So if you can measure the direction of nuclear recoils, then that provides you with another signature. There's a, a diurn or daily modulation in, um, in the direction of those nuclear recoils for a WIMP signature. Uh, another point to note is that given that the energy threshold is so important in these experiments uh, and we need to have as low an energy threshold as possible, there is a complication. That's a, not all the kinetic energy of a recoiling nucleus uh, is typically visible in, in any detector. Um, and this means that the, what we call the visible energy threshold, which is effectively the, the energy threshold that you might, for instance, uh, calibrate with um, uh, a gamma ray source with electron recoils or something uh, is, is much greater in many experiments than the, re the nuclear recoil energy threshold. Uh, so we have to understand that. It's quantified with what are called Lintart factors. Um, these are energy dependent uh, and it's, they're basically the ratio of the, the energy that's recorded for a nuclear recoil to um, that uh, recorded for an electron recoil of the same energy. Um, and it's typically something like 25% for a liquid xenon scintillator detector. So you're losing basically 75% of your energy uh, into 
into channels which are not observable in that case. So you have to calibrate your experiments. Um, typically, this is done with a, a monoenergetic nuclear beam, uh, uh, sorry, monoenergetic neutron beam. Um, so you fire monoenergetic neutrons into your target. If you can measure where those uh, neutrons go, the direction of scattering, and you know the incoming energy, then you can, from simple kin kinematics, work out the energy of the recoiling nucleus. Uh, and then you compare that with what you observe, and that gives you your Lintart factor. Um, so you can typically um, uh, therefore calibrate nuclear recoils to what's called the electron recoil energy scale using a neutron beam. Um, and then that then means that during running, you can then uh, calibrate your experiment with, with electron recoils, which are much easier to generate uh, with small radioactive sources, for instance, or, or internal radioactive sources. And so you can calibrate your detector with uh, electron recoils and then convert to nuclear recoil energy using these pre-calibrated uh, Lintart factors. So backgrounds to these searches. Um, as I said, electron recoils produce the, the most common backgrounds, um, uh, but these are in principle reducible. And a lot of the, the, the considerations in designing a, a WIMP search experiment relate to how to reject electron recoil backgrounds. So um, Compton scattering is one key source uh, from gamma rays, um, as I mentioned earlier, beta decay and two neutrino beta de double beta decay from contaminants inside the target, such as Krypton 85, Argon 39, Xenon 136, Radon 222. Um, these are all things which have to be worried about. Uh, radon 222 is a particularly concerning one uh, that comes from uranium and thorium chain decays so you have uranium and thorium in in the detector materials and in the surroundings of the detector uh, this can generate radon which is a, a noble gas and that can permeate into your target um, and then through a long chain um, of alpha and beta decays it can it can generate various beta decays which are basically low energy giving you low energy electrons so if this radon gets into your target, then um, it can generate uh, electron a large amount of, of electron recoils. And indeed, if you look in the top right-hand figure, one, one example from projection from the Lux Ectoline collaboration, that radon 222 is, is really the dominant um, background at very low energies for electron recoils. So you need to do something about these electron recoil backgrounds. Nuclear recoils, as I said, can be generated by neutrons from uranium and thorium chain fission or from cosmic ray spallation. Um, they can also be generated by um, uh, this, again, this coherent elastic scattering of uh, neutrinos um, from um, solar neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos, and also supernova neutrinos. And this is basically called sevens is the sort of the jargon that's used for this. Um, and this is not something we've ever had to worry about really before um, with lower sensitivity experiments, but we, experiments are now getting to the point where uh, we have to start worrying about um, backgrounds for this process. And this is basically irreducible background. It's, it's nuclear recoils from neutrino scattering. So how do you mitigate this? Well, you make a very radio pure target and detect materials with few radio, little radioactive contamination. You shield everything with low radioactivity lead or copper or ultra pure water and also if you have a large target so you build a big detector then um, if you have some way of, of defining a fiducial volume within that target uh, so rejecting events from the outside of the target then if the target itself is very pure then you basically get self-shielding you basically um, you can define an, a central region where all of the incoming or a lot of the incoming gamma rays are absorbed in the, in, and, and vetoed effectively uh, by interactions in the, in the skin or the outside of the, of, of the, of the target. Uh, you need to operate your detector deep underground to shield out cosmic rays. Um, you want to veto electron recoil events, and I'll come on to that in, in a second. Uh, and also you want to veto, um, you can try to veto neutrons uh, coming from ur uranium and thorium chain decays by looking for the gammas or the neutrons themselves if they interact in a veto detector around your target. So many of these detectors now 
Im embed their target inside a veto, uh, which might, for instance, uh, have liquid scintillator in there, and that will pick up either the coincident gammas from the uranium and thorium chain decays or uh, scattering of uh, or capture of the neutrons themselves, uh, and then thereby you can uh, reduce those backgrounds. So underground labs, there's a very large number that have been developed these days. Here's just a photo of a, of a few of them. Um, clearly, the key question is is vetoing, uh, sorry, is, is, is absorbing uh, cosmic ray muons uh, from the atmosphere as they come into your target. So you want to go as deep as possible and you, you, you usually measure the depth in what's called meters water equivalent. So that's um, basically the equivalent depth of water that would have the same absorption for cosmic ray muons. Um, and so you can see just a few examples here. And the experiments I'm going to be discussing are, are, are based at all of these uh, locations and others. So as I said, um, coherent elastic neutrino nuclear scattering uh, is um, in principle an irreducible background to these searches. Um, as I said, it's been observed uh, with a terrestrial source uh, of neutrinos from um, a coherent collaboration. Um, and this provides what's called the neutrino floor, uh, beyond which direct search uh, experiments become dominated by background systematics. In other words, you can't reject these backgrounds um, uh, because basically neutrinos will always make it into your target and they give rise to nuclear recalls in just the same way that, uh, that um, WIMPs do. So it's an irreducible background. Um, uh, depending on the mass, uh, different neutrinos uh, dominate. Um, so we can have, for instance, beryllium-7, boron-8, and at high masses, um, atmospheric neutrinos and um, uh, supernova, uh, diffuse supernova neutrinos. So these really provide, a, 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 to a certain extent, a limit on, on how far we can go. If we can really precisely predict this background, then, of course, then uh, you can get down into the uncertainty on the background, that becomes your limiting factor. But that's why you have to really have a really good understanding of the systematics in, in this, this process. Uh, significant progress beyond the neutrino floor probably requires the use of halo signatures like annual modulation, dire directionality, etc. Um, and just briefly, I'll touch on this very briefly. Uh, if you're interested in low mass WIMPs, then uh, so much less than say a GEV, then um, you really have a uh, difficulty that the kinematics is no longer favorable for scattering off atomic nuclei. So if they couple to electrons, then the kinematics are more favorable. Uh, and uh, so you can, if you're prepared to discard your um, uh, rejection against electron recall background, if you look for an electron recall signal, then that can get you down to lower, uh, lower masses. If you're interested in low energy nuclear recoil signals, then um, the ability to discriminate electron from nuclear recoils uh, falls off to very low energy in most experiments. So you could discard that discrimination. Or another possibility is to use more electron-like nuclear recoil signals, which in principle can be generated by the atomic physics of uh, what happens when a nucleus is, is effectively knocked out of an atom by, um, uh, by an incoming WIMP, that leaves then excitations of the atomic system um, and also can uh, generate electron recoil signals. So this, this process of effectively the, the shaking up of an atom from the re nuclear recoil is called the Migdal effect. And this is something which is being used now to push limits to very low masses in some experiments. It's not actually yet been observed in nuclear scattering. So it's, it's, it's sort of theoretically predicted. Uh, and there's a few other experiments which have sort of uh, uh, indicative, but definitive evidence for the Migdal effect is, is still to come. So um, uh, it's something which is being looked at, um, but it does enable us to get to lower lower masses. Um, and I just touch on the fact that these same searches can also be used uh, to search for other sorts of uh, dark matter. Uh, an example would be dark photons. So these are from theories which have an extra U1 gauge symmetry. Uh, and there you can have a, an extra photon, effectively an A prime, which mixes with the standard model photon. 
and that then gives a weak coupling to matter. Uh, and if that is very light, if it has a less mass less than twice the electron mass, then it can't decay to any standard model states. So um, uh, that could be a dark matter candidate in that case. Um, so that'd be very light um, and uh, very broad mass range down to you know, a tiny fraction of an MeV. Um, but um, this, these kind of experiments we're discussing now can provide constraints on dark photon dark matter. Um, so we can look for electron recoil signals from basically from dark photo ionization, basically. So a dark photon coming in the same way as a, a normal photon might and ionizing uh, an atom. Um, so these are uh, one, one route and these provide, um, these experiments that I'm gonna be talking about provide strong constraints. Um, there are also constraints from stellar astrophysics, which I, I, won't, I won't touch upon. Okay, so I'm, I, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go through fairly quickly through the various experiments and technologies that we have. But the, there's so many experiments. The thing I really want to sort of focus on and, and, and draw your attention to are the different technologies which are used, because this is really a, the thing which sets out sets this field apart from many others is a very broad range of different types of experiment and detector that are used. And this all comes down basically to the fact that your dominant background is electron recoils. Your signal is a nuclear recoils. You need to tell the difference between the two. So there are many different technologies which have been developed to um, enable that uh, discrimination. Uh, here's a few cartoons of, of various techniques that are used. And they basically rely on the fact that when a particle recoils through a target, um, then it can generate uh, it can generate charge. If you if you apply an electric field, you can read out ionization. It can generate light if you have a scintillator material, um, and then it it will always generate heat. And actually, that's where the majority of the energy goes is into the heat channel. So if you can read out the heat. Uh, possibly in the form of phonons in a, in a crystal material, then um, you stand a good chance of getting a low energy threshold. Um, and you need to be able to reject electron recoils. And the way you can do that is by comparing uh, the amount of energy which goes into the, into the different channels, heat, charge, and light. So if you can read out two of those three, at least, compare the amount of energy you record in those two channels, then um, you have a way of telling the difference between nuclei and electrons. Basically, nuclear recoils have a much higher linear energy transfer, higher dE by dx, effectively. Uh, and that means that the um, emission of light and charge is quenched. Um, that's what that Lind those Lindhart factors basically um, quantify. It means that, that the higher energy density along the track uh, means that more of the energy goes into heat uh, and, and, and less into the other channels, and the, and the amount going to the different channels differs. So we want to read out multiple channels from different experiments. Um, I'll just start with um, the, um, uh, what are called uh, so sodium iodide detectors. So these are basic scintillator detectors. These are the first uh, uh, dark matter, some of the first dark matter experiments to be built. Um, they have the advantage that in sodium iodide, which is a crystal, um, iodine is very heavy, it has A127, so good A squared. And here um, you can use, in fact, you can discriminate electron from nuclear recoils actually just using scintillation. So the pulse shape of the scintillation pulse uh, differs between the two um, uh, uh, electron nuclear recoils. And so that can give you some discrimination. It's not always used actually, but uh, that, is, that is a possibility. Um, the Dharma experiment from the 1990s onwards, uh, uh, Grand Sasso, have claimed evidence for annual modulation signature in low energy um, events at something like 9.3 sigma, which is what you see in the, the top right figure here. Um, so that could be evidence of annual modulation coming from uh, a dark matter interaction. However, um, other sensitivity of other experiments, which we'll come on to, has really excluded this hypothesis. Um, but there could be some loopholes from the fact that these are using different nuclear targets. So um, more recently, this has been tested with other sodium iodide detectors in cosine and anise. 
Um, and uh, really there's not been anything seen here um, to, co to corroborate this. So it's still an open question. Um, is this due to some modulation of something happening in the environment like the temperature or something? Or is it something to do with the backgrounds? Is the, the amount of, for instance, radon in the detector changing with over the course of the year uh, between winter and summer? Uh, still an open question, but there's clearly a modulation there. But what the origin is 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 um, is, is open, and it's not certainly not been confirmed to be dark matter yet. Now, liquid xenon detectors are really the, the most sensitive detectors, certainly for spin-independent interactions at the moment. So they dominate the sensitivity at the moment. Um, and the idea here is that in a volume of liquid xenon, um, an incoming WIMP um, will cause a recalling nucleus, which will generate both scintillation, which we call S1, and an S1 signal, and also ionization, um, which we call S2. So that ionization is drifted in an electric field, in effect, it's a time projection chamber, into a high field region at the liquid surface. And in this high field region, uh, there's, there's um, electroluminescence take place, takes place, which generates more photons, the S2 signal. And we read out the photons from both the S1 and the S2 uh, with photomultiplier tubes. And because of the drift time for the charge, the S2 signal is separated in time from the S1 signal. So we can identify the S1 and the S2 signals and the ratio of the two uh, basically measures how much ionization, how much scintillation was created. And that then gives us our means of discriminating uh, electron recoils from nuclear recoils. Uh, from the pattern of light, we can also identify the X and Y position uh, of, the, uh, of the interaction. And this means that we can fiducialize uh, the interaction. We can measure where it occurred, basically. Uh, and that allows for good self-shielding. Uh, and also, of course, if you see multiple scatters, uh, so multiple S1s and multiple S2s, um, then that also tells you that you're not dealing with a WIMP signal because WIMPs only interact once in your target. They don't interact multiple times. Uh, advantages, uh, high mass, atomic mass 131 roughly. Uh, you have uh, spin-dependent isotopes, very radio pure. This discrimination method gives you 99.7% uh, electron and nuclear recoil discrimination for 50% efficiency at low energy. Uh, and it's a well understood technology. There's been a, a, a long series of experiments uh, using this and developing it. Uh, one disadvantage is that it's, the xenon is relatively expensive. It's something like $1,000 per kilogram. So if you want 10 tons, you know, you're, you're looking at $10 million of, uh, just, just for your xenon target. So um, briefly, there's, there's a, 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 been a series of experiments uh, over the past few years that have really pushed and really leading the, the way in terms of uh, spin independent cross-section limits. Um, Lux uh, in the US, 145 kilograms. Uh, then we had uh, Panda X2 in China, uh, 300 kilograms. And then more recently, uh, the Xenon 1 ton experiment, um, following on from the Xenon 100 experiment. Um, and that has now got up to 1300 kilograms fiducial. So this is over a ton uh, of target, uh, fiducial target. Um, so that shows you really how the limits have uh, been pushing down. If you look at these limit curves on these three slides, how they push, push down further and further below 10 to the minus 10 picobarns for the spin independent interaction cross-section. Um, a key consideration in these experiments is Krypton 85, which gives you a beta decay electron recall background. And so a lot of effort has been put into removing Krypton 85 using chromatography or distillation in these various cases. Uh, now, Xenon 1 ton has seen an excess at low energies of something like 50 electron recoil events, very low energy, 2 to 3 kV electron equivalent. So that's the electron recoil equivalent energy, um, which could be evidence for interaction of, uh, for instance, a solar axion in the target or bosonic dark matter that would have a significance of more than three sigma, but equally it could be due to an additional uh, unmeasured tritium beta decay background. Um, so this has been tested in the Panda X2 uh, experiment in China. Uh, there's not re it's no real conclusive answer from that. Um, however, more recently, there's been some studies from the NEST collaboration, which is basically 
uh, a collaboration which is modeling the interaction of nuclei and electrons in noble, uh, noble liquids like argon or xenon. And there they've, they've raised the point that this could be just uh, due to um, contamination of argon 37, which can generate uh, 2.8 kV gamma rays from electron capture, which then give rise to electron recoils. Uh, this also fits the energy spectrum. You see that it's sort of in these plots at the top, uh, top left and bottom left, you see the excess at low energy um, above the, the red line in the top left figure. Um, so that could be due to this argon 37, which is what you see in the bottom left. And there's also some evidence for a 35 day half-life for this, um, uh, for this uh, decay. So that could be evidence that this is actually argon 37. Anyway, this is again an open question uh, and will be tested with the next generation of experiments, which are just coming online now. So um, we have um, xenon n-ton, which is total mass of xenon 8.3 tons, Lux Zeppelin in the US, 10 tons, and also in China, Panda, 44 tons. Um, so these are close to operation. Or they're actually generally in commissioning at the moment. So we should expect to see results from them in the, in the near future, perhaps by the end of the year or, or early next year. Um, and then beyond that, um, there's a number of even bigger experiments being proposed. There's Darwin in the, in the EU, uh, Generation 3 in the US. There's actually a, an MOU now for a merger between um, uh, Lux Zeppelin in the US and, and Xenon and Darwin. Um, so actually that maybe that there is one big um, uh, Xenon, uh, liquid Xenon dark matter detector in, in, certainly in the US and, and Europe uh, on the cards. Uh, but there's still R&D needed for this. We need to work out how to re remove radon more effectively, cleanliness for the materials, for radioactive contamination, possible possibilities for tagging radon chain decays, uh, and also how to get the very high voltages that are needed for these big detectors to read out the, the charge. Okay, uh, liquid argon detectors. Um, these, for, generally speaking, follow a similar uh, approach to the liquid xenon detectors. Um, and um, so that I, I won't go in detail through that. It's basically the same principle in, in, in the next generation, certainly. Uh, they have a big advantage that, several big advantages. One is that the Scintillation pulse shape itself enables uh, discrimination between electron recoils at very high uh, um, purity and efficiency. So the, um, you get something like 10 to the 8 re background rejection through pulse shape discrimination um, in liquid argon, much better than in liquid xenon. Um, and uh, it's very low cost material, uh, argon. Uh, so it's obviously being used in much larger volumes in, uh, in, in experiments like June. Um, and we can leverage neutrino experiment exp expertise for these targets. Uh, the disadvantage is that argon is lighter, so it has mass of 40. So you have a factor 10 less sensitivity than xenon. Uh, the scintillation is at deep UV, 128 nanometers. So you need a wavelength shifter to read out the scintillation signal. And there's a big background from argon 39 from cos cosmic ray spallation. And so you need to do something about that. Uh, that background. So the um, uh, the experiments which um, are op op have operated recently, uh, Deep 3600 in Canada, uh, this is actually just a pure scintillator target. So this just looks at the scintillation signal um, and it uses the pulse shape discrimination to reject, uh, reject the background. Uh, typically these targets have much larger masses than liquid xenon for when it's cheaper uh, target for a start. Um, but as I said, there's, the argon 39 is, is a big issue. So if you look at the bottom left hand figure, you'll see this big distribution at low energy, which comes from the beta decay of, of argon 39. Um, so um, this is, can be rejected with pulse shape discrimination, but um, uh, the problem is that it gives a very high rate in the, in the detector, which can cause pile up of events and can, that can cause difficulties with um, with identifying a signal. So this is a, a, an issue, but, but so Deep 3600 um, has produced some good results. Um, but the next phase of experiments uh, will actually use double phase like in liquid xenon. And another thing that they will be looking at is using um, depleted argon, so depleted in argon 39. 
Uh, the first phase of this, dark side 50, um, this uh, uses what's called underground argon. So argon that's been taken from a deep well uh, underground. Uh, and this has, so it's protected from cosmic rays. The argon 39 decays over long uh, time scales. And so this reduces the amount by a factor of 1400. Um, and in the next generation of experiments of dark side uh, 20K, um, by the uh, Global Argon Dark Matter Collaboration, as it's called, um, this will have a larger target mass. And there, in addition, there will be um, cryogenic distillation of the argon to, to the huge 350 meter uh, distillation column. So you can see <laughs> higher than um, the um, Eiffel Tower, but basically in a, in a mine, in a mine shaft. And the goal here is to reduce the argon 39 by a further factor of 100 uh, versus underground argon. So this is a rapidly developing technology and this, this could become uh, strongly competitive with the liquid xenon uh, targets in the, in the near future. The next phase after this will be a 360 tonne target with the argon ex uh, Argo experiment. So I'm running out of time. So I'm, I'm gonna briefly touch on a few of the other technologies. Um, germanium detectors, these use, these use a combination of ionization and heat readout. Uh, to, again, they compare the two uh, uh, channels to discriminate electron from nuclear recoils. Super CDMS is um, a key um, uh, player here. Uh, and uh, also we can use uh, silicon as well as germanium. It's also semiconductor material. That gives us sensitivity to lower mass targets. There's been some evidence for an excess in, in CDMS2 in 2014, um, but um, this hasn't been confirmed by other experiments. And one thing to observe with these, these type of experiments, these solid crystal uh, experiments, is that um, you have to be very careful with surface effects. So if you get a, a, a background isotope, uh, like lead 210 or something depositing on the surface of your crystal. If you can't on that surface read out efficiently both, both your ionization and heat signal, then it could fake a, uh, a, a nuclear recoil background, basically through imperfect readout of charge. So you have to be very careful with surface contamination in these kind of, of experiments. Uh, and there's a plan uh, or under construction, uh, a next, next phase experiment called Super CDMS in, in Canada in Snow Lab. Uh, Edelweiss and Crest uh, are also cryogenic. These, these are cryogenic experiments. They have to operate at very low temperature. Edelweiss is similar to CDMS uh, in Modan in, um, in Europe. Um, Crest actually then reads out scintillation and uh, and heat and phonons in, in, instead of uh, scintillation ionization. This has the advantage it uses calcium tungstate. Tungsten is very heavy. Um, and um, so it has an A of 184. Uh, and uh, so that means basically that, that that gives you very good enhancement for, um, uh, for spin independent interactions. Again, you have to be careful with surface events. And these two uh, experiments will be merging into next phase called Eureka, which will have a much bigger target. Uh, and again, we'll take forward the same technologies. Okay, I see I'm out of time there. So I think what I'll probably do is stop here. Um, I have some more slides on other technologies. I think I can probably round them off tomorrow. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so um, is that okay? I, I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot, Dan. This was a very nice uh, lecture. Does anyone have any comments or questions for Dan? If you can raise your hand. I see uh, Robert, please go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, I have a question. What is known or at least assumed about the directional velocity of uh, the winds uh, so that one can maybe extract from yeah, where, where the winds impact on your detector um, uh, if this is really a WIMP or if it's a different source. Can you say something on that? Sure, yeah. Well, that maybe that, that gives me, uh, I'll just skip forward to the directional detectors just, <laughs> to, which rather than covering that tomorrow. But so, yeah, now, of course, the thing to note here is that the directional signal is not generated by the, anything to do with the, the WIMPs themselves. So the, the, 
although it could be, <laughs> we normally assume that, that we have um, uh, a thermalized halo. So what, when we build directional detectors, the, the directional effect we're actually looking for is coming from the motion of the earth rather than the, or the motion of a de detector on the surface of the earth. So it's, it's the motion of the, uh, of the earth on its axis, which is of course extremely well known, uh, the motion of the earth around the sun, which is also very well known, and then the motion of the sun around the galaxy, which is slightly less well known, but is also, um, you know, Reason, reasonably accurately known. So that, those are actually not the biggest uncertainties. The bit bigger uncertainties are the properties of the halo itself, which are, so that's the halo velocity dis dispersion and even whether it's a Mac pure Maxwellian halo. Um, but um, uh, those are just some assumptions that you, you have to make. But the actual directional signal itself is generated by the motion of, of the Earth rather than motion. That means the, the halo is always isotropic in that sense, right? So that's what no... we assume. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. now, you could argue that maybe that's not the case. Um, and in particular for light WIMPs, um, or rather actually for, for axions, which is something which I'll come on to tomorrow, um, there have been quite a few studies done on, on, on really quite complex structures in the halo where, um, we could actually have tidal streams, tidal disruption, which could give you cusp, what's called cuspy dark matter, where you have very complicated uh, halo velocity distributions, which could give all sorts of weird and wonderful um, um, signals in a, in a dark matter detector. Um, but um, again, that's something which, which really comes from modeling. So we're not relying on that in any experiment, really. We're, 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 we, usually just assuming a, a thermalized halo of some of some description which could be a simple maxwellian halo or it could be something a bit more complicated a bit more squashed in phase space um, and that's actually what comes from recent studies with gaia and, and other astrophysical experiments but anyway it's we make some assumptions okay thank you okay i think we probably have time for one more question if anyone has a question I don't see one. So actually, I was wondering, since you mentioned, Dan, um, that you can calibrate the nuclear recoils using neutrin uh, sorry, neutron beams. Uh, I, I was, are the large systematics associated with that? I guess these are very low energy neutrons, right? Uh, they're, they're low energy neutrons, but they're being produced by um, a well, very, very well understood nuclear process. So it's typically fusion fusion process so it's it's dd so you have a deuterium target with firing deuterons or dt so you have a tritium target firing deuterons and so the the energies of the of the neutrons that come from that are, are, are very well understood probably a bigger systematic actually comes from more from the um uh the scattering uh, sorry the the um the detection of the neutrons after the scattering, that's a more challenging job. Uh, you need to measure the angle of scattering very accurately, for instance, so that's, that can be problematic. And it's difficult to, for the same reason that it's difficult to identify WIMPs, uh, nuclear recalls from WIMPs, it's also difficult to identify and detect neutrons with high efficiency because of backgrounds. So, so it's, it, it, isn't, uh, it isn't a particularly easy job, but, um, but there's been lots of studies of this. But, but the energy um, that the neutrons have is at the same energy that you would expect the WIMP interactions to be at? No, 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 they're much, much, so they are obviously much lighter than the WIMPs that we're typically looking at. They're, they're an A of one, <laughs> effectively. So, um, so they are actually much uh, higher energy. So typically you're looking at um, uh, 2 point, uh, was it 2.85 MeV, I think, for DD. Um, and uh, nearer 14 MeV for DT neutrons. So they're, they're higher energy neutrons, and they're, but they're scattering off a heavy target. So they're giving much rise to much, um, much lower energy nuclear recoils. But the, so, so, so they're higher energy, but they're lighter. Does this mean the kind of um, signature comes out to be similar in the detector? Y yeah, so you, you it, it, it depends on the scattering angle. So if you're looking at small scattering angles and you have a light incoming probe, namely the neutron, then the recoil energy will be very low. And so 
for a sufficiently small scattering angle or if equivalently a sufficiently low energy neutron, uh, you can basically generate nuclear recoils of, of exactly the right energy range for, for WIMP scattering. In fact, one of the nice things that people are looking at is, uh, as well as looking at small scattering angles, you can decrease the energy of the incoming neutrons by, rather than having a direct beam coming from your DD or DT generator, you can look for backscattering of DD neutrons from a secondary deuterium or hydrogen target. And in that process, the neutrons lose most of their energy through the first scattering off the secondary target. And then you have much lower energy neutrons coming into your dark matter target to, um, to, to calibrate it. So that's how you can get really low energy uh, uh, recoils for calibration. Okay, great. Thanks. That's really interesting. Um, okay, I think uh, we probably should call it a day now. So uh, the last lecture is tomorrow at 11. And so hope to see you then. Thanks again, Dan. See you tomorrow. Okay.